So <laughs> I'm Frank Song from the UCLA team, and the PI is Warren Mori. And today I'm going to talk to you about particle and cell simulations of laser plasma instabilities. Yeah. All right, take your time. Um, so, um, I'm, so the, my, there are many people working on this project. They, some of them include Victor Desek, who is the co-guru of our group. And we have two postdocs. One is Wei Mingan, who is doing problems related to plasma-based accelerators. And another postdoc, Ben Winjin, who is actually doing uh, particle and cell simulations of laser plasma instabilities related to laser fusion. And, um, you know, I, I, as I scan the room, I know there's not too many plasma physicists in this room. So the takeaway points from my talks are that, oh, it's, it's coming, it's coming up. Uh, that um, we, Blue Water has been very useful for us. We're getting a lot of interesting physics out of the machine. And, you know, we'll be happy, and we'll be happy to take more time if give, that's given to us. And hopefully I'm going to show you our, some of our efforts in code development to show you that we are ready for whatever is coming up next in for the next generation of supercomputers. So, all right, so here, all right, our talk is up. And these are my collaborators once again, and I'm representing the UCLA simulation group. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the particle and cell method. Not too much because it was covered in the previous talk. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our code of Cyrus. And I'm going to show you two problems related uh, to to the, to the things we're doing on blue waters. One is that of plasma-based accelerators. In this problem, we're using lasers uh, to drive a very large amplitude wave and try to accelerate particles to very high energies. And the uh, application, of course, is to, uh, for accelerators. And of course, the second problem is um, study laser plasma interactions uh, relevant to IFE, which stands for inertial fusion energy. In this case, what we're really trying to do is minimize the amount of laser plasma interaction because we want the laser to actually reach the fusion target and compress the target and achieve fusion. So even though they're opposite goals, the physics is very similar. And so I'm going to show you that particularly for this problem, we're nowhere close to the kind, the blue water is not yet there to do the full problem. So hopefully this will serve as a motivation to the last topic I'll be talking about, which is co-development on the GPU and on the future vector machines, such as the Intel Phi and beyond. All right, so this is a, the schematic of the particle and cell method. I'm going to skip this slide for the sake of time, and it was covered in the previous talk. Just to say that it solves a very basic set of equations, solves the Lorentz equation and also the Maxwell's equation. So for systems which are highly nonlinear, you don't know what turns to keep, what not to keep, uh, the first principle-based methods are very useful for that because you're not throwing away any physics here. So the particular flavor of pet code we're using is the code Osiris. It's a code that we de developed here at UCLA. And for the audience here, I just want to point out some of the features of Osiris that's of interest to you. One is that it has an open MP and MPI hybrid parallelization. And we have very good performance on all the, um, all the latest and the greatest supercomputers. And as of last year, we achieved over two petaflops sustained performance on blue waters. And also, we, we showed good strong and weak scaling on over 1.5 million cores on the Sequoia supercomputer when it came online last year. All right. So now let's dive into the physics. So the first problem of two I'm going to talk about is plasma-based accelerators. So what is it, and what is it good for? All right, the plasma-based accelerator is made up of three parts. So usually in, in this accelerator, uh, you have a driving bunch, and the driving bunch loses energy to produce a plasma wave. And then the second part of the accelerator is the witness bunch, and the witness bunch picks out the energy from the plasma waves and it's accelerated. And the plasma sits in the background, it acts uh, to transfer energy from the driving bunch to the witness bunch. And if, so there are two flavors of this type of accelerators. One, so if you use the laser as the to drive the plasma waves, this is called the laser wave field accelerator, or the LWFA. And you can, of course, if you can also use the particle beam here as, as the driver, and, and this method is called PWFA, or plasma wave field accelerator. So there are many applications for accelerators. One of them we all know about, of course, is uh, to study particle physics, such as the LHC in, in Switzerland. And of course, 
um, another application for accelerators is you can use it as a light source. And just recently, for example, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, SLAC, is now no longer used to study particle physics. It's now been turned into a facility called LCLS, which stands for Linite Coherent and a coherent, oh, line a coherent light source. Oh, there it is. I, I did write it down because I never remember it. And so this light source is, is very useful for, for studying things like protein structures and to visualize things on a very on a femtosecond time scale that other light sources are not capable of. And of course, uh, accelerators also have medical applications, such as you can use it for chemotherapy to kill cancer cells. All right. So, all right. So, why plasmas? Well, actually, the idea is. So to understand why we need to go to plasmas, we, we can just look at what's called the Livingston curve, which is the, the maximum energy achieved by accelerators as a function of time. And accelerators were invented in the 1930s by Ernest Lorenz. And so it's the cyclotron, which has uh, energy of about 1 MeV. And since then, it's, so it sees an exponential growth from 1930 to around 1980. And since then, the, the conventional technology has saturated. And the reason for the saturation is very simple because energy is just force times distance. And the force that you can put on a conventional accelerator is limited by the material. There's a, for, if you use metal uh, to build, if you build metal-based accelerators, then there is, a, there is a maximum for the amount of fuel you can put on it. This is called a breakdown limit, which is if you put any more fuel on it, the, the metal will not support that field. Rather, the metal will just short itself out, will break, will, so this is what's known as the breakdown limit. But of course, in plasmas, you don't have this limit because plasmas is ionized gas. It's already broken down. So you can put a much larger field inside the plasma. So the idea of a plasma-based accelerator is proposed in 1980. An experiment started around 1990. And you can see the same curve now plotted since the beginning of plasma-based accelerators in 1990 all the way to the present day. And you can see the plasma-based accelerator has already caught up to conventional accelerators in terms of energy. But in terms of beam quality and so forth, we're not quite there yet. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our current ongoing research. And here are some of the highlights in plasma-based accelerators. And simulations play a very important role in all, of these, in all of these experiments. And the one that I want to highlight is the energy doubling experiment done in 2006 in Stanford. So in this experiment, a slag beam, which has a peak energy of 42 GeVs, and it achieved the, it goes from 0 to 42 GeV in 3 kilometers of conventional accelerator. And then we put this 42 GeV beam into a 1 meter long plasma. And you can see, and so this beam, some of it loses energy, and it goes down. In, so now this is a function of number of particles versus energy on the x-axis. I don't think you can read this very well. So you can see schematically what happens, some of these particles lose energy to drive the plasma wave, while other particles uh, seize this plasma wave and gain energy. And you can see over a one meter long of plasma, the, um, the, energy, the maximum energy of these particles has doubled its original energy. So you can see this is a very promising, this is a very promising technology. In one meter, we're able to achieve what two, like three kilometers are achieved in a conventional accelerator. And also, and so in the blue curve is actually a, the energy spectrum taken from the experiment, and the red curve is a simulation that was done in our group. And you can also see there's good agreement between simulation and experiments. And what's more is that simulation provides insight to, as to why, if you make the plasma longer, that there, you were not going to get any more energy gain. There was actually, there was a limitation for this particular experiment. And in the next set of experiments, we expect to see um, more energy gain. All right, so I'm going to show you some recent results. So I'm going to um, start by showing the result using, uh, using a laser called a Callisto laser. Callisto laser is one of the largest short pulse lasers in the world. It's 200 terawatts and about 100 femtoseconds. And the Callisto laser in this experiment go through a two centimeter gas jet and the laser energy is now converted into energetic electrons. And then the energetic electrons passes through a magnet, and the image is collected into a CCD camera. Okay, and the, the energy of these energetic electrons is, um, is determined by how much the electrons are deflected by the magnet. So here you see 
uh, the image is in the CCD camera for different shots. The shot number is on top, and the energy is roughly the vertical axis is the energy of these particles. And here you see a big bright spot roughly at 1 GeV, and this is what theories predict the energy to be. So, however, from about every 20 shots or so, we see a ring structure, and these rings are not, these are not just random rings, and these are, are not noise, because these rings are very reproducible, and the rings all have the same energy between um, 180 to 250 MeVs, and they're very, they have a very small angular spread. So, um, we decided that this is something that's worth looking at, and we actually, we had, even before, even before we did the simulations, we had some ideas as to why these rings were formed. And here we go. And here are some results from 3D simulations. And what I'm plotting here, so the color, the color map in the background is uh, the plasma density. So we're looking at uh, the accelerating structures produced by the plasma. This is called the first bucket. And so the plasma formed these buckets, which are accelerating structures uh, on which the electrons sit and they serve on these plasma waves and they accelerate. So this is the first bucket and this is the second bucket. So this is the end of the simulation and we see a formation of these rings. And just by looking at this picture, we decided, hmm, it must be that um, the electrons in the first bucket must have so much charge that when the electrons from the second bucket catches up to it, it's repelled by the electrons from the second bucket, from the first bucket, and it's, re it's repelled and it uh, goes into the side and it forms this ring structure. That makes a lot of sense, we said. And then in fact, we actually, we claimed this in several conferences and based on, you know, based on our previous knowledge. But then once we did the simulation, we realized, oh, that's not at all the case. What is actually happening here is actually the evolution of the laser. Um, so here's the, so on the bottom, I'm plotting uh, the focusing force as a function of position. And this is about halfway through the simulation. It's a snapshot halfway through the simulation. This is a snapshot at the end of the simulation. As you can see, um, at the end of the simulation, the, the, plas the plasma accelerator is what's known, as in what's known as the blowout regime, where you can see inside the bubble, the field is strictly focusing. It's a very beautiful accelerating structure. I may have time to say a little bit more, or not, actually. Um, so, no, actually, I don't have time to say it. But what happens is that the laser, in fact, was a little bit too wide to be in the blowout regime early on in the simulation. So you see in the second bucket, uh, only the back half is focusing, but the front half is actually defocusing. So the, the electrons come to the front of the second bucket, is defocused due to the fact it's not in the blowout regime, and splits apart, and then when it reaches, when at the end of the simulation, when it's in the blowout regime, it sits in the lobe. It sits in the lobe, but where there's a sun focusing field, and part of this, these electrons are trapped, and most of them are, in fact, defocused. That's very interesting. But then, however, we get quantitative agreements between um, simulations and experiments. So here I'm plotting a 3D plot of the isosurface, of the plasma isosurface, mm -hmm. and also showing the energetic electrons as dots. And you can see we get roughly the right energy, and we also get good agreement um, in terms of angular spread. And, but simulations, of course, provides insights as to the, the reasons that these rings are formed. All right, so actually I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip um, the second topic. I'm just gonna cover it very quickly. So, and the other topic is to study, using particle and cell code to study PWFAs. This is the work by Dr. Wei Ming An. So for, Plasma wake field accelerators, some of the topics are we want to, we want to study simulation, we want to look at um, PWFAs using positrons as a driver. And this is not, this, you cannot study this using theory because, uh, of course, if, if you can make an antiparticle plasma, then the, pos the physics of a positron PWFA will be exactly the same as that of an electron. But, of course, we don't have antiparticle plasmas. So somehow we have to propagate antiparticles in a regular plasma. And the theory for that is not well developed, and the only way to, to look at these, this problem is through numerical simulations. And of course, uh, we want to um, make sure these particle beams have small angular spread and also small emittance. And the small emittance problem is most interesting because emittance is actually just a fancy word for uh, transverse, it's the angular spread of these particle beams. So because we want very small emittance to increase the number of interactions in these, in these beams, it requires very fine transverse resolution, and so these simulations are very memory intensive. 
And so these are very well suited for blue waters. And this was the example I was going to give, but I don't have time to do that. So just to show we did some very interesting work in this area also. So finally, the thing I want to talk about last is uh, laser plasma interactions. I think I'm gonna, five minutes? So, okay. Oh, really? I thought I had, okay. Because I'm looking at my watch, I only have three minutes. So, all right, so I sh I'm gonna go a little slower. So, and talk about laser plasma interactions on this. So yeah, I, I don't know, I'm just going by the watch. So, you know, as I talk, said earlier, so, okay, in laser fusion, the lasers used to compress the, the uh, fusion pellets. And in this case, of course, laser plasma interaction is actually detrimental to, to this process in two ways. One is, of course, we just mentioned earlier, uh, laser plasma interaction produce hot energetic electrons. And these energetic electrons will reach the target and cause it to heat up. And of course, if you have, the, if, the, if the pellet become more heated, then it has larger pressure. When it has larger pressure, it will be more resistant to the pressure given by the laser. So then it will, the laser will have a harder time pressing on the target, causing it not to uh, create fusion. And also, the LPI uh, will scatter light backward toward the source, and so the laser, if the laser undergoes LPI, it cannot reach the target. Of course, the LPI is a very complicated problem because it has many time scales and many um, length scales. And here I'm showing you the different time scales and length scales of the system. And just to tell you that the length scale spans about three orders of magnitude, the laser wavelength is about a micron, and the total propagation distance is about a millimeter. And in terms of time scale, there are six orders of magnitude. From the smallest time scale is the laser period, which is about one femtosecond. And the largest uh, time scale is the, is the duration of the laser pulse, which is about a nanosecond. All right. So currently, most of these uh, studies are done using 1D particle and cell simulation codes. And so what we do is that after each, uh, after each shot, the theorists can generate, uh, can reproduce the plasma conditions using the hydro code. And so we take the, hydro, the plasma conditions from the hydro code, and we can do a series of 1D simulations along any of these paths. And from the 1D simulations, we can actually uh, tell you what is, the, what is the backscatter light you can detect, and how much energy is transmitted to the target, how much light is reflected, and how much of the light is converted into hot electrons. These are things that uh, the experimentalists want to note. And of course, this being, um, this being a full PEC simulation, we can actually tell you the various physical processes that led to the energetic electrons. I don't have time to dis discuss all these processes, but I just wanted to know it's very interesting. And it's very rich. And these are, these are so this is the primary process, and, this, and then you get secondary processes such as rescatter. And these are not things you respect just by doing linear theory calculations. Yep. But however, um, 1D simulations is simply not sufficient because in, in the real, in the real NIF, the, the laser is actually made out of this thing called quads, and each quad contains, in fact, contains four lasers. And each of these lasers are not smooth and are made out of these uh, many, many speckles. And if you do the linear analysis, you can, sh you can demonstrate that the the system is only un unstable inside the hotspots, but it's actually stable elsewhere. But however, you cannot just say, well, th these, are the only, these are the only areas where I expect to see laser plasma interactions. That's actually not true. Because with using two-dimensional uh, PIC simulations, we demonstrated that um, a above threshold speckle can trigger events in below special areas in three different ways, actually through seeding from backscatter light and uh, through seeding from plasma wave traveling from an above threshold speckle to a below threshold speckle, or through the process known as inflation, where hot electrons uh, going from an active area can travel to a below threshold area, and this changes the distribution function, which in turn changes the um, Landau damping, and this, can, this is another way where SRS can be triggered in the area that's below threshold. And really one minute. All right, so just to say, so these simulations, so now we're currently uh, doing 2D multi-speckle simulations along a NIF path, and these simulations each requires a million CPU hours. And we can also look at the interaction of two speckles in 3D, and these simulations is also fairly reasonable. It requires about nine million core hours. 
However, if you want to look at the multi-speckle simulation in full 3D, these simulations require one billion hours or two, uh, two months on the entire Blue Waters computer. And of course, this is not possible. So it requires code developments. So I don't have time to talk about our work in code developments, just to say that we have a GPU code available, and we, we have demonstrated that the GPU code is about 50 times faster than, um, than one core on the Intel i7. And also, we also have demonstrated um, a parallel GPU code, and we showed that the parallel GPU code scales very well uh, up to many GPUs. I'm only showing the results up to three GPUs here. And on three GPUs, it's, it's about as fast as about 140 Intel i7 cores. And on three GPUs, the scaling is almost perfect. It's about 2.9 times scaling. And so just to say, these codes are available for download from our website. And so I, with that, I guess I'm going to take questions.